This video is going to look at the role of chromosomes and hormones in gender development. If we have a look at your specification, you must know the role of chromosomes and hormones, and in particular, what is testosterone, estrogen, oxytocin, and what is their role in gender development. And this is a really, really big topic. Remember, the most you're ever going to get asked is a 16 mark essay, and the content in this video is probably going to go beyond that. But when we're in lesson planning the essays, you're going to have to pick out which bits you would want to put in your essay. OK, so I'm probably going to give you more information than you need, because I think this is the most fascinating part of the whole topic of gender. And there's so many interesting and fascinating studies out there. But it's really going to be up to you when we come to planning our essays to pick out the bits you're going to remember and you're going to be most relate to genes, hormones, chromosomes and their effect on gender development. So the first thing we're going to look at is the role of chromosomes. And after conception, and a few weeks after that, there are no structural differences between a genetically male and female embryo. No structural differences whatsoever. And each person has 23 different chromosomes. And each of these chromosomes contain hundreds and hundreds of genes which give us the instructions for physical and behavioral characteristics. So these genes will determine your skin color, eye color, hair color, um, aggression levels, your personality. So each person has 23 of these different chromosomes. So one pair of chromosomes, that 23rd pair, are called the sex chromosomes. And they're called that because it's that chromosome that determines an individual sex. So females will have chromosomes XX, males will have the chromosomes XY on that 23rd pair. And the baby sex is determined by the father, by the sperm, because sperm is the only thing that carries the Y chromosome. So it's the father who determines the sex of the child. And the Y chromosome itself causes testes to develop in an XY embryo. So in a male, fetus, the chromosome, that Y chromosome, will be what causes testes to develop. And when the testes is about three months old, if it's going to develop as a male, the testes will start to produce androgens, or as you will probably more commonly know it, know them as testosterone. And that testosterone will cause the male genitalia to develop. So at three months, the male genitalia starts to develop because the testes start to produce testosterone. So there's usually a direct link between your chromosomes and the genitalia. XY have a penis, XX will have a vagina. There's usually a direct link between the two. So chromosomes basically determine the genetic sex of an individual. Um, but most gender development is actually governed by hormones. And the hormones are produced prenatally and during adolescence and puberty. But chromosomes do affect gender development because of that link between genes and genitalia and hormones. The genetics you have will determine the hormones that are released. So that's how your chromosomes affect your gender development. So like we previously stated, it's hormones that do most of the work for gender development. Chromosomes obviously determine what hormones are going to be released, but it's hormones that determine gender development. So the main one that we've already discussed is testosterone. And on average, males have about 20 times more testosterone than women. So you can see target sites for testosterone. It affects the brain, it affects muscles, the kidneys, bone marrow, it affects bones, sex organs, your liver, skin. I wouldn't necessarily write any of that down. Okay, You won't necessarily need to know all these parts. We'll go into what parts you specifically need to know. But it just shows you how many target sites testosterone has and the big effects it can have on development and especially gender development. So the next question is, when are hormones actually produced? Well, they're produced prenatally, so while you're in the womb, and also during adolescence or puberty. And hormones influence a range of different things. The production of genitalia, so when it's prenatally. Your development of your brain, so when you're in the womb, if testosterone is released, the baby's brain will be affected and it changes the structure, the neural pathway of the brain prenatally. And it also influences gender behavior. So high levels of testosterone have been linked 
to higher levels of aggression. So hormones have a really large influence on a range of different traits, behaviours and attitudes in people. So you don't need to get this particular graph down, but it does show you when the hormones are released. So the blue line indicates testosterone. And you can see here a peak prenatally. So when the little fetus is in the womb and the baby's in the womb, it's released, which affects genital production, brain development. Um, and also, here in adolescence, there is a peak and a rise in the levels of testosterone during adolescence and puberty, which again goes on to affect things like body hair, growth, deepening of voice for males. So testosterone is mainly produced during those two periods, prenatally and during adolescence. So now we're going to have a look at the roles of different hormones. And remember, you've got to know about estrogen, testosterone and oxytocin. So the first one we're going to look at is estrogen. And estrogen is the female sex hormone. So like it says on here, breasts growing, pubic hair growing, wide hips start to develop. And it's really responsible for female sex characteristics and the development of female sex organs. It's also the hormone that starts the menstruation process. And it's also the reason for premenstrual tension, so PMT, and when it gets really bad, um, premenstrual syndrome. Okay, and PMS and PMT have really been successfully used in the past um, in defence for cases such as shoplifting and even murder. So it shows that some cases people who have been tried for murder have used high levels of oestrogen, PMT, PMS as a reason to get off from their murder charge. And oestrogen is really linked to characteristics such as nurturing and caring characteristics in females. Testosterone, on the other hand, is all linked to body hair in men, so on the face, chest, um, deepening of the voice, muscle growth, and it's the development of male sex organs and characteristics. Testosterone has been linked heavily to aggression, so the way it changes the brain can result in more aggressive behaviour. And also spatial awareness, so men are more, more adept and more efficient at spatial awareness tasks. And if you remember, it's produced at three months and during adolescence. Um, one of the big things that testosterone does, especially during prenatal development, is it masculinizes the brain. It changes the pathways in the brain. And we're going to have a little look at study in a bit when we go into the evaluation of Quandango's animal study. Okay. We also have oxytocin, which is in larger amounts in women than males, and it's usually linked to when they're giving birth, because it stimulates lactation and milk production. But it has an awful lot of other roles as well. Oxytocin, for example, reduces cortisol release, um, and cortisol is a stress hormone, so it should reduce stress levels and facilitates bonding between a mother and a child. And it's often referred to as the love hormone. But it does lead to certain stereotypes of hormone, the fact that women have more oxytocin, men have less oxytocin, has led to the stereotype that men are generally less involved in intimacy and less able to love than women are. But one of the big things is because it reduces that stress response, it also dampens the fight or flight response, that release of adrenaline. So you're going to fight or you're going to run away in flight. Um, and that's why some people have suggested women have a different response to stress um, and that they respond with a tend and befriend response. Okay, remember we did that in AS where they'll tend to their children, befriend other women as a social support network during times of stress. And that's how they deal with stress. And that is linked to the high levels of oxytocin. It's also really useful for us to investigate intersex individuals because it teaches us about the role that hormones play in gender development. So what we do is we study individuals who have been exposed to abnormal levels of prenatal hormones. And we can make a comparison then to, let's say, um, a male baby who had too much testosterone, or too little testosterone, or a female baby who's been um, exposed prenatally to higher levels of testosterone or lower levels of testosterone, we can compare them to what we consider normal or typical exposure. 
So one type of intersex individual will be someone with AIS or androgen insensitivity syndrome. And look at the keywords, androgen, so we know that's testosterone, insensitivity. So we know that they are resistant to testosterone. So it might be a baby in the womb that three months testosterone gets released, but that baby is resistant. The testosterone doesn't affect that child. So AIS occurs in people who are genetically male, so they have XY chromosomes, but they're resistant to testosterone. Their body will not respond to the hormone when it's released. And what happens is that person will have all the physical characteristics of a woman, okay, because they won't have that exposure to testosterone. But they'll be genetically a male. So they'll be XY, but they won't have grown a penis, they won't have um, all the characteristics of a man that's linked to testosterone because their body is resistant to the hormone. In women, you can get something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH, and you can just refer to this as CAH in your exam. CAH is when we have a female, so an XX female, who's exposed to really high levels of testosterone prenatally. And what happens is they start to develop ambiguous genitalia. And if you want to look up pictures of what that looks like online, that's absolutely fine. Didn't think it was quite appropriate to shove them up on here. Um, because they have these masculinized effects of that male hormone. So it's genetically XX females in the womb, but experience high levels of testosterone. And that testosterone causes them to develop ab ambiguous genitalia. One of the main roles of hormone development is the effect it has on the brain. And it's thought that testosterone, especially, masculinizes the brain. And this is responsible for the differences between men and women. For example, most women appear to be better at social skills, so empathizing, forming relationships, whereas men are far better at spatial tasks like spatial navigation, working things out. And Gershwin and Garibaldi came up with a theory linked to this idea. And they said that testosterone is the main factor that causes the difference between males and females, and that testosterone masculinizes the brain. And um, because male brains are exposed to more testosterone prenatally than female brains, that is what masculinizes the brain. Um, and if the brain of a female is exposed to higher levels of testosterone prenatally, then that will masculinize their brain as well. And that might be one of the explanations why we get tomboys, so girls who act as though they're boys during childhood. One reason may be that their brains were exposed to higher levels of testosterone than other females. So now we're going to go and have a little look at the evaluation points for this theory. And just like the AO1, I'm going to be giving you far more than you need, but there's just so many interesting studies in this particular area that I'm going to give you the choice when we come to planning our essays to pick which ones you want to include in your essay. The first study we're going to look at then to support the biological theory on gender development is an animal study, and it shows how testosterone masculinizes the brain. Quindango conducted a study where, and he found that female monkeys who were exposed prenatally to testosterone, so what they did was they injected the mother monkey with testosterone during pregnancy. So the female babies were exposed prenatally to higher levels of testosterone. They found that those monkeys tended to engage in more rough and tumble play so more masculine behaviours than traditional and other female monkeys. And this shows us that hormones masculinise the brain. They, those monkeys um, that were given testosterone injections prenatally, it affected their brain development and that went on to change their gender behaviour. However, we do have methodological issues with this. Things such as it's an animal study. So can we generalize these findings to the human population? But again, I'm not going to go through the methodological paragraphs. You should be in a position to elaborate on these yourselves. Another study to support the biological explanation on gender development was conducted by Wallen. So Wallen got 44 male and 44 female observant monkeys. And he gave them a number of toys. So they gave them two masculine toys, a ball and a police car, two feminine toys, 
a doll in a pot, two new good toys, a picture book, and a stuffed dog. And what they did was they measured how long the monkey spent with each of these toys. And their data showed that male monkeys spent significantly longer with the masculine toys. And female monkeys spent significantly longer with the feminine toys. So this shows us that there must be a biological reason for certain gender preferences and gender behaviours. Because these monkeys haven't been socialised. They haven't had any parental treatment, peer pressure to act in a certain way. So this study shows that there must be a biological reason for these types of behaviours. And again, we have the methodological issue. If you were to include those two animal studies, you could write them both up and then do a methodological issue about them being animal studies afterwards. So you could have Quandango, Wallen, and then an issue with both of these studies is they are animal studies. And then add your four ladder paragraph from there. So we're now going to have a look at a contradictory theory um, put forward by Dr. Money. Dr. Money studied children with ambiguous genitalia. So sometimes we'll call those children intersex children. Um, for example, you might have a child born with a very small penis, maybe lower levels of testosterone prenatally. So they might surgically reassign that child to be brought up as a girl. Change the genitals, bring that child up as a girl. Dr. Money and Dr. Earhart, who we worked with, believe that biological factors had very little effect on gender identity. They believed it was all due to social factors. And that was their theory of neutrality, that children were born gender neutral, that any child can be socialised to become masculine or feminine. And he said that if any gender reassignment occurred before the age of three, it would be successful, that you could raise a genetically born male as a female as long as it occurred before the age of three. And there is a very, very famous case study on this. Um, I'd like you to watch this video. We're going to try and watch bits and pieces of it in class. Um, and it's the case study of David Rimmer. You don't need to make any notes on it because it's such a detailed case study. But it will give you a real depth and understanding of this particular case study because we're going to use it a few times in a few of the different topics that we're looking at in the gender topic. David Rimmer's case study. David was a small boy born as a twin who had his penis burnt off during a botched circumcision. Um, and he was raised as a girl under the guidance of John Money. The parents turned to John Money. They had this boy born with penis that had now been burnt off. Didn't know what to do. But John Money's theory of neutrality said that we can raise this child and socialise it to be feminine. So John Money met with the twins regularly. Uh, David Rimmer and his twin brother, and reported the whole thing was a success, that the child with a botched circumcision, who was renamed Brenda, was a complete success, had responded well to the socialisation, was happy as a girl. Whereas in success, David Rimmer was never happy as Brenda, always felt like he was a boy, always felt out of place around girls, wanted to play with boys' toys. And as soon as he was told the truth, he turned and reverted back to being a male. Um, he went on to have um, a marriage, brought up stepchildren, um, but couldn't really deal with the issues that had gone on and eventually committed suicide in 2004. So what does it tell us? What does the money study of David Rimmer actually tell us? It tells us that biological factors are more important than socialisation. David Rimmer was biologically pre-programmed to be male. And that treating him like a girl for many, many years did not appear to have any effect over his identity as a male. And it's that biologically pre-programmed part that's really important. From conception, he was XY. He was going to be genetically male. During prenatal development, his brain had been masculinized by the testosterone. So he was always biologically pre-programmed to be male. And bringing him up as a female didn't work. Okay, so that is the real reason that John Money, although he has his theory of neutrality that contradicts the biological theory, his main study on David Rimmer goes against his theory.
So again, Rio and Giha looked at intersex children. So 16 genetic males who were all born with no penis. So these would be people who had AIS. Their bodies were resistant to the testosterone. Um, two, of the boy, two of them were raised as boys, even though they had no penis. And the remaining 14 were raised as girls. And what they found was, by the age of 16, eight of those 14 had reassigned themselves to being male. So remember, after each study, you must have this shows that link it back to the theory. So this shows us that these children were always biologically pre-programmed to be male. The fact that a majority of them reverted back to being boys, even though they were raised as girls, indicates that nature and biology, genetics and hormones have a big impact on gender development. There is contradictory evidence to this theory as well, and a study conducted by Tricker. It was a double blind study, so the participants didn't know and the researchers didn't know about which treatments they were getting. And they had 43 males who had weekly injections of either testosterone or a placebo. So remember, it's double blind. Researchers didn't know, participants didn't know. And what they found was that there was no difference between the two groups over 10 weeks. So they would have measured a range of different characteristics, including things like aggression levels. But there was no difference between the two groups after 10 weeks. So again, this shows us that potentially biology and hormones don't have a major impact after prenatal development. Potentially prenatal development is where most gender development starts to occur. And any influences after that may not have a major impact. So we're going to look at an IDA point now. Um, and again, you can use that reductionist paragraph that we've learned. It's a reductionist paragraph because it ignores psychological explanations. It ignores um, psychosocial explanations. It ignores a social learning theory. It's also a determinist theory. Biology, it says, is the determinant of your gender. Your genes, your hormones determine your gender. It ignores the idea of free will. And you also have a real world application that if a gene was discovered that had that could affect gender development, so for example, cause gender dysphoria or cause gender identity disorder, then it could result in an increase in abortions, which is a socially sensitive issue. Are we better off with this research or without this research?